Hey everyone, we took a couple weeks off over the holidays, but we're back to work now, so it's time for another devlog. First of all, I'd like to show off some editor improvements that I made. Last time I showed off the ability to edit these splats, but at the time you couldn't actually change what sprite was displayed for them, but now you can. I've added this drop-down menu, which allows you to pick out which image you want the sprite to display, and this isn't hard-coded. Uh, this is actually loaded dynamically from a folder uh, in the games directory. So when the game starts up, it looks in this splats folder and dynamically loads every image that's in here. You can see that if I uh, add a new sprite into the folder and then restart the game, now we have that sprite available. Of course, if I save the level, that information will get saved along with it, but if I then go and delete the image that I just added, then you'll see that it shows up as this very obvious missing texture, so that situation is detected and correctly handled. Correctly handling the saving and loading of these texture references is actually surprisingly tricky. See, when the textures are loaded from the folder at startup, they're just put into a big list. And so each texture is identified by an index into that list. But because you're gonna be adding and removing images in the folder, the index of a given image might change between different runs of the program. So you can't just store the index in the level file and call it a day. There are a number of ways you could think to solve this problem. For example, you could store the full file name of the image with every single splat but that would make the serialization code slower and more complex, and it would also significantly increase the size of the level files. You could hash the file name string instead to an integer and save that. That's a lot better, but it's weird in a few ways. First of all, you would rely on the hashes of two file names never colliding, which with say a 32-bit integer is very likely, but it's not something you could really guarantee. Also, once you had chosen a hash function for the file format, you would never be able to change it. Otherwise, old levels wouldn't be able to be loaded. Instead, I decided to go with the hybrid approach. Instead of storing the file name directly with every single splat, we store in the file a list of all of the sprites that that level uses and then we store an index into that list instead of an index into the global sprites list. And then it's just a matter of mapping between the global indices and the level-specific indices whenever you save and load a file. You can see here an example. Here's the binary file that represents the level that we were just looking at. And if I tell my editor to try to interpret this, as text, you'll see a bunch of garbage at the beginning of the file, because this isn't textual data, but then at the end you'll see all of the file names of all the sprites that are referenced. Another major feature that I worked on is splat reordering. So in addition to being able to specify the position and rotation and scale of a splat, you also really want to be able to specify the um, ordering of splats with respect to one another. So which splats show up on top of which other splats? Now, there's a concept of uh, splat layers. So splats on two different layers will always show up in front or behind one another. But within the layers as well, you want to be able to easily control the order of things. Now, this is just determined by the ordering of splats in the splat list. Splats are drawn, you know, first to last, back to front. But it would be very cumbersome to have to edit the global order of the list. For example, say I have this splat over here and this splat over here, well, I don't really care uh, whether this splat over here is in front of or behind this splat over here because they're nowhere close to overlapping. What you really want is a way to reorder splats only with respect to other nearby splats, and that's exactly what I've implemented. So I've added these buttons over here, 
kind of similar to what you might see in like PowerPoint or some other such program. There's send to back and bring to front buttons, which do exactly what you'd expect. Those are pretty simple. But then there's also these push backwards and pull forward buttons. And these move the splat one layer at a time, only relative to the splats around it. Here you can see a debug visualization of how we compute that. We take the rectangle of the texture and check for overlap with all of the other textures on that layer. And so if I select this one, you can see it highlights all of these other ones that it's overlapping. And I can move it around and see that update. And this should make dealing with sprite ordering very easy. Another thing that you might have noticed is that we've added parallax. So we have these layers in front, which are at the same depth as the player. Um, but then we also have these layers in back, which move less and less as the camera moves until the furthest layer uh, is at infinity and it doesn't move at all. And you can see that uh, this parallax effect is respected in edit mode as well. That way it's very easy to see how things will look uh, from different camera positions as you're editing the splats for a given level. And to make this even easier, I've added these sliders which will change the range of layers that splats will be displayed for, so you can look at only the layers that you care about. And this is accomplished with a shear matrix which is incorporated into the view matrix calculation, similar to uh, what I talked about with the shadow mapping before. And finally, I've extended the functionality of multi-select. So now you can select multiple things and mass delete, or you can copy and paste selections. And you might also have noticed uh, these things over here, and these are archer enemies, much like in the original prototype, but significantly improved. So in the original prototype, the behavior of archers was very basic. They would just shoot at you on a timer if you were within a certain range, and they would shoot an arrow uh, with a constant velocity directly towards your current position, which has some kind of silly behavior. For example, this archer right here who's, you know, only a few meters away from me but isn't able to hit me because he's not arcing his shots at all. This new implementation of archers is very similar, but the calculation for how they shoot their arrows is much improved. So the archers will now correctly arc their shots to be able to hit you from any distance, and although it's disabled right now, they also have the ability to try to play the player's motion forward and predict where the player will be at the time that the shot lands, so they're able to lead their shots very accurately in most situations as well. Of course, this isn't actually how they'll behave in the finished game. There's a common uh, erroneous line of thinking that game devs oftentimes fall into, where we think that a good game AI is an AI which is good at playing the game, uh, but that's actually not the case at all. A good uh, video game AI is one that's fun to play against, not necessarily one that's actually particularly skilled or sophisticated. It should be difficult and sophisticated enough to pose a challenge, sure, but if it's so sophisticated that the player can't easily understand and predict the AI's behavior, at least to some extent, then they won't be able to make plans about how to fight the AI and successfully execute on those plans. And that ability to make plans and execute them is sort of where the fun of the gameplay comes from. So you actually want the enemy AI to have clear and exploitable weaknesses. And you certainly don't want it to be able to snipe you from all the way across the map with a robotic accuracy that just feels unfair and uh, frustrating and isn't really fun at all. So what we'll likely do is some mix between the strategies. So we'll have the archers do something somewhere in between aiming directly at the player and perfectly arcing their shot, and we'll have them lead their shot somewhat, but not all the way. And combined with just a little touch of randomness in the speed and velocity of the arrow, that should feel more like a fair fight against a fallible human opponent. Now, in the original prototype, the arrows had some somewhat sophisticated behavior. If an arrow was flying through the air and it hit you, you'd die. 
Otherwise, if it hit the ground, it would uh, stick into the ground and become a solid object. Otherwise, if it hit anything else in the level, like the lance or another arrow, then it would become broken and no longer able to attach to the ground or cause damage. And if you touched an archer with the tip of your lance, uh, then the archer would die. And archers could also kill each other with their arrows. In the new implementation, all of those old behaviors are intact, and there are several new behaviors as well. So you can see that if I touch an archer with my lance, the archer dies. Um, and if an archer hits me with an arrow, then I die. And if the arrows hit face first into the ground, then they attach to the ground and become solid. But now the arrows don't break anymore when they hit another object. Instead, they just keep going and uh, continue to be deadly. So you can see that we're able to, for example, fling uh, the archer's arrows back at them. Of course, right now the criteria for being killed by an arrow is a little bit silly. For example, if I just touch the tip of an arrow that's on the ground, then I die. But that can be fixed so that arrows need to actually be traveling at you know, an appreciable velocity and imparting an appreciable force and need to be traveling head on and, and, and so on and so forth in order to not kill the player unfairly. But the fact that the arrows sort of remain in play in the game until they get stuck into something is, I think, a really interesting behavior. You'll also notice that, just like the lance, um, arrows now are able to be impaled into props as well. And in fact, they're also able to be impaled into uh, the player when the player dies. So you can see here I've got this arrow just stuck into my head. And of course, they can be impaled into uh, fellow archers as well. You might also notice that the these arrows have this very beautiful um, clean arc where the uh, point of the arrow remains uh, facing forward, which didn't happen at all in the original prototype. In a lot of games that I've played, to implement something like this, arrows are essentially treated as a point in space and the direction of the arrow is a purely cosmetic thing, which is just rendered at a particular angle based on the current velocity of that point. For example, here in Minecraft you can see that an arrow shot directly upward turns around in midair pretty much instantly as soon as it reaches the top of its arc and the velocity goes from being positive to negative. Um, granted, there's a little bit of uh, easing involved. But in this game, we need the arrows to be able to interact in a physically simulated way with the environment. Arrow direction isn't just cosmetic, it has actual gameplay relevance, and the arrows are represented by a rectangular physics body. And so we can't just set the rotation of that physics body based on the velocity, because that would uh, be buggy and break the sim in various ways. So we have to find a way to achieve the same result with some sort of physical simulation or physical system. And the way that we do that is by using a sort of drag model to apply essentially a corrective force to the arrow to make it always uh, tend towards pointing in the correct direction. So you can see that the arrow follows its usual arc, uh, and then when I hit it, and cause it to start moving in a different direction all of a sudden. It sort of uh, takes some time to correct and wiggles a little bit uh, before it gets fully back on track, and that's a result of the physical simulation. So you can see here I have a diagram of an arrow. There's the head here, which is uh, the deadly part, and there's the tail here, which is actually where all of the forces are going to be applied, and this is what we're going to be looking at. You can imagine that the arrow is moving through the air in some direction, let's say diagonally down into the right. So from the arrow's perspective, which is what we care about, uh, you can also think of it as the air moving against the fins of the arrow in the opposite direction. So what we care about is the velocity vector of the arrow moving through the air. But specifically we care about the velocity vector of the fins, the tail of the arrow moving through the air. And so you need to take the rotational velocity of the arrow into account as well. So for example, if the arrow is rotating about its center of mass, which is somewhere around here, uh, in, say, a clockwise direction, then you account for that by adding some velocity to the tail of the arrow in the perpendicular direction, clockwise direction here. 
And this turns out to be actually important for getting a good simulation. Anyway, so you imagine the uh, force of the air pushing in some direction against uh, the fins of the arrow, and it's going to be imparting some force here. You might want to instinctively apply the force in that direction, um, but the air isn't actually pushing against some like round, blobby, you know, generic object here. It's pushing specifically against a flat surface of one of the fins. So you actually want to apply the force along the normal of the surface of the fin, perpendicular to it. So in the case the air is pushing from this direction, we push this way. If the air was pushing from the other direction here, we'd push the other way. And it actually doesn't matter if the air is pushing, you know, up this way or down this way against a particular surface of the fin, you still uh, just push it in the same direction with the same force, regardless. You might intuitively think that you care uh, about what you know, direction forward or backwards the air uh, is pushing, you know, because you want the arrow to be pointing forwards, not backwards. So it seems like it should matter, but actually the fact that you're applying this force at the tail of the arrow instead of at the center or at the front is what makes it, is what gives it a preference for uh, pointing forward as opposed to backwards. So if it tries to fly backwards through the air, it's, it's just aerodynamically unstable. In terms of how much force to apply, obviously the faster the air is moving, the more uh, force it's going to impart. Um, in the case of this game specifically, we use a linear drag model, so we increase the force linearly with the length of this vector. This isn't strictly the most physically correct thing, I don't think, but it's what we found to be best for gameplay. And of course, the more directly sideways the arrow is, the more uh, sort of area of this fin is going to be available for air to push against. And you can account for that by just taking the dot product of the uh, direction of the wind with the uh, normal of the fin surface. That dot product also happens to give you the sign of the force as well, to tell you whether to push left or right. And it happens that the way the math works out, you don't actually need to care uh, whether the normal that you construct is, is clockwise or, or counterclockwise to the direction of the arrow. It just works either way. I feel like I made it sound kind of complicated, but this is actually the whole equation. You just take the normal vector here, scale it by the dot product of the error velocity vector and the normal vector, and then just scale it by some constant factor to get your force, which you apply here at the tail of the arrow. There's lots of parameters here you can tune, obviously the drag coefficient, you can tune uh, the drag model to be non-linear if you want. You could even tune how much the rotational velocity of the arrow uh, affects it, which will affect how much the arrow wobbles versus how quickly it stabilizes. Anyway, if you ever find yourself making a game with arrows in it, I highly recommend giving this model a try. In my opinion, it's, uh, it's really elegant and, and versatile. One slightly more technical thing that I wanted to talk about with regards to uh, the editor features is a change that we made to the undo system. The undo system in this game is actually fairly simple. We don't do any fancy diffs or anything, we just store undo states as a full copy of the entire level. When we undo, we take the current level and push it onto the redo stack, and then take the top item off the undo stack and and replace the current level with that. For redo, we just do the same thing, but in the other direction. And that's all fairly straightforward and you know, nice and simple. The annoying part, though, is whenever you make a change to the level in the editor code, you have to manually push the current state of the level onto the undo stack. And of course, because there's a lot of editor code and a lot of different uh, ways in which you can make an edit that changes the level, you have to spam code for that all around and it has some adverse consequences. First of all, any time you add a new piece of functionality to the editor, you have to make sure by hand that that works with the undo system. And that's very error prone. You know, you could easily forget to add the necessary code in some place, and then you aren't creating undo frames when you should be, or you could even write the code in such a way that you accidentally create multiple undo frames when you don't mean to. In fact, that second one that I mentioned is particularly insidious. For example, say you uh, have some logic in the editor for dragging a control point, where whenever you click on a control point, you want to begin dragging it with the mouse, and so whenever you click, you'll create an undo frame. But then if you click, and then don't drag, you'll be creating multiple undo frames for no particular reason. And in practice, that's something that happens a lot because you have to, for example, click on these 
splats in order to select them to then be able to edit their properties over here in the property editor. And the way that that worked with this MGUI GUI code in particular uh, was very annoying. In order to make changes via the MGUI code uh, undoable as well, we would have had to write a lot of boilerplate. But I realized while grappling with these problems that there's actually a better way to do things. So I've written this deep equals function, which takes two levels and tells you if there's any meaningful difference between them. The obvious use of this is to avoid pushing duplicate uh, undo frames like I talked about before. But if this function is sufficiently robust, you can actually use it to implement undo in a completely different way. And the new way that we handle undo is actually really dead simple. This is pretty much the entire code. Instead of attempting to push an undo frame only on certain actions, we actually try to push an undo frame every single frame. We just have to use this deep equals function to check if we've changed anything since the most recently pushed undo frame. The one major caveat to this, of course, is that some things move continuously. So for example, if I start dragging this splat around, well, while I'm dragging the splat, basically every single frame, its position is changing. So the level will be different every frame, but obviously you don't want to push an undo frame every single frame that you're dragging something around. That would be ridiculous. But the fix for that is really simple. Uh, instead of just checking that we haven't made any changes, we also check to make sure that we're not uh, currently interacting with anything and dragging it around in a continuous way. In the case of this editor, that is as simple as checking whether the left mouse button is held, because currently that's the only way that we do any sort of continuous interaction with the level. In other level editors, of course, this condition might be significantly more complicated, but the point is that as long as you can define these two functions, one to tell whether you're making a continuous change to the level, and another to tell whether you've made any changes since the last undo frame, then you can get a really nice and robust uh, undo system basically for free. And in my opinion, this is a really nice system. It's very clean. It's pretty much totally automatic once you have it in place. It avoids having to strew undo system code all over the code base and avoids the tedium of having to write that code. It perfectly solves the duplicate undo frame problem. You can see here that I'm clicking around on all these different control points. The number of undo frames isn't increasing. In fact, if, for example, I drag this control point to the snap grid and then do a drag where I drag it around but then ultimately end up at the same place, I don't even get an undo frame there, which is really nice. Same thing with editing these entity properties. And of course, all of this MGUI code uh, becomes, you know, robust to the undo system for free, for no extra effort. And it's even relatively easy to modulate what is considered to be a significant change to the level. For example, you can see that right now, changing the selection, changing what's selected, doesn't create any undo frames. But if I move the selected objects, that does create an undo frame. And if I undo those frames, the selection does get sort of carried along with those frames. Right? So the selection information is stored in the undo system. We just don't create spurious undo frames for it. And if I wanted to change the code so that we did create undo frames for changes in selection, all I would have to do is make a small change to the deep equals function to check for equality between the selection lists. So this is another idea that if you're implementing an editor like this with an undo system, I would recommend giving this a try. I think it's really neat. Anyway, one final change that I'd like to talk about is that I re-implemented a GIF recording. If I press Control G, I'll start recording a GIF. I can do just about anything. And then press Control G when I'm done. And here in the game folder, you can see this is a GIF of everything that we just recorded. 
This is actually exported using a library that I wrote. It's a very fast and easy to use library for GIF encoding, which I'm actually quite proud of. You can see this GIF that we're looking at is, you know, only six megabytes, and the quality is pretty darn good, if I do say so myself. To my knowledge, it's the fastest GIF rendering library, at least that I was able to find. It also saves out GIFs that are smaller in terms of file size than other libraries that I looked at. And although this last point is a little bit subjective, it, in my opinion, has the highest quality results as well. Anyway, I'll link that in the description of the video in case anyone uh, is interested and wants to take a look. It's public domain, so if you want to, you can use it in your projects and do basically whatever you want with it with no limitations. I had a similar GIF recording feature in Escher, but it was implemented in a slightly different way that had some problems. For example, here in this recording that I just made, you can see that this arrow is a little bit broken and the GUI doesn't show up at all for the editor. That's because in Escher, all of the rendering code is factored out into a function, and in order to render the GIF at the highest possible quality, we actually render the entire scene a second time into a separate buffer at a smaller resolution. And that difference in resolution between the window and the buffer that we're rendering into kind of breaks Dear MGUI and makes us have to do a lot of weird logic to correctly handle uh, visuals that are based on the mouse position in the window. With Happenlance, though, you'll notice that the GIF rendering shows the GUI stuff just fine. That's because instead of rendering the scene a second time at the correct resolution, we just pull down the full resolution frame buffer that we rendered into normally, and then downsize it on the CPU. I repurposed some old code that I had for downsizing frame buffers using SSE. Doing this on the CPU might seem kind of slow, but as you can see, we're actually able to downsize a 1920 by 1080 frame buffer down to 480 by 270 uh, by a factor of four in you know a fraction of a millisecond, so it's not really a big deal. Ultimately, probably once the game is finished, I'd like to package uh, some of this code up in an easier to use form to make a library for fast resizing of images uh, on the CPU, which could be very useful in tandem with uh, my GIF exporting library. But that will take a fair bit of work to get all that working nicely. So for now, I'll just post this code mostly as is alongside the handmade network post for this devlog and I'll link that in the description as well. Anyway, that's all for now, but I'll see you again next week, hopefully, with some more uh, exciting progress.